great pleasure uh, to introduce uh, Jan Toon Van Ries, who comes here along with his uh, co-collaborator, uh, Jacqueline Kuder, who does the video. Uh, Mr. Van Ries has produced the, the photographs uh, from Amsterdam, the Netherlands. They are both very accomplished artists. Uh, Mr. Van Ries has shown internationally uh, in numerous venues and is also in some very significant collections, uh, including the Museum of Contemporary uh, Photography in Chicago and the uh, Museum of Contemporary Art in Amsterdam, the Stanley Museum, uh, which was just recently renovated, and of course he's documented that as well. Uh, along with other uh, numerous collections, exhibits. Uh, so please give a warm welcome to Mr. Ben Rees. Oh, yes, thank you very much. I'll put it here. Well, thank you very much for your uh, overwhelming uh, attendance, uh, I must say. Can everybody hear what I say? Or is the noise of the video too much in the way? then uh, I'll, I can just proceed on, on, on this uh, level. Uh, now, I'm kind of new at this, so uh, I actually have not really a clear idea of uh, what I'm supposed to do. Um, <laughs> but uh, for one thing is that while the exhibition is up, the works are there. Uh, there's a list which describes exactly uh, which photograph was made where and who did which work, Jacqueline Tutor or me. And we put an additional list with some remarks so as far as I'm concerned, I would say like all the information is there, so it's not up to me right now to sort of like tell everything about the photographs. Um, that um, is, information is already um, uh, available and then I think it's usually to, up to the audience to, uh, to look and make associations and uh, connect things. Um, but um, first I would like to uh, uh, I will tell you a little brief uh, maybe introduction to my uh, kind of like, uh, well, um, um, career. And um, otherwise I can as well explain something about the selection and the organization of the entire exhibition as such, which is, does not include the separate works. Um, and then after I've done that, uh, I would say like uh, I would hear as many questions as you would like to, uh, to ask. Um, though there is one thing uh, which, which I thought is maybe kind of like maybe nice or not, um, I don't know. Uh, but the work sort of like appears on different levels. It's not that you could say, oh, it's all fine art and uh, photographs can be used in so many different <coughs> ways. Um, that I think that within the exhibition and all the information there is, uh, for example, I can imagine that there's a, a room for interpretation from, for example, a painterly uh, perspective or from a design perspective or a photographic perspective. So I would really appreciate it if you try to direct your questions as much as possible in relation to the uh, department or section or, you know, that you are s studying with because that means that you kind of like try to interpret it to a certain discipline and then sort of like bounce it back to me. Um, now, um, I'm studied, uh, I studied actually a long time ago, I was educated as a painter in a uh, five year uh, full time uh, teaching program in the Netherlands uh, and then started uh, ambitiously uh, making paintings and drawings and trying to uh, uh, discover my own style. That kind of like went uh, well, sometimes difficult and hard, as everybody's life. Uh, and at some point, to create continuity, um, I took up a job uh, at a bookstore in Amsterdam, a uh, part-time bookstore, so I could develop my own artwork uh, independently from financial pressure, uh, which I really needed at the time. You might see some um, remnants from that uh, uh, period uh, in the exhibition. Um, during those years, uh, my work from painting and drawing gradually moved towards photography. And uh, since 2002, I'm working independent as an, as an independent entrepreneur, CQ artist slash photographer. Um, now, as using photography, of course, uh, the benefit of photography is that it does not necessarily always have to be fine art. You can use photography as well in a very functional way, and it can be 
applied on many different levels, and that created space as well for a room for uh, uh, picking up and, and accepting different kinds of, of assignments and commissions, which actually then, after that, impacted my personal work as well, and, and vice versa. So uh, that means that, in effect, uh, since 2002, um, actually, or a little earlier, I stopped asking the question to myself with everything that I do, whether it was art or not, or what it should look like if I thought it should be art. In other words, a lot of questions that you can haunt yourself with that doesn't, don't lead anywhere, to my purpose, uh, to my uh, understanding by now, because suddenly it seemed when I, when I make the decision not to ask the question anymore whether it is seriously serious art that I do, um, I was possible to immediately do what I thought that needed to be done in order to visualize what I wanted to show. And um, from there on, actually, things took, a, well, went much, much more, much better. And it took me actually 10 years of life to be able to, uh, to get to that state where it didn't matter to me anymore whether the work you do is categorized as art or as, as something else. Um, and basically what it means is that then that I started projects just sheer from, from curiosity um, that I want to do something and then by doing so uh, it was like the request was formulated so then it was the, the projects were picked up and then commissions sort of rendered from there on and so it was that self-initiated projects uh, created the question, the request for for commissions afterwards, and that's sort of like something which, at least over the past decade, I can say, like, uh, made me uh, very uh, fortunate in the sense that uh, I, I was able to do exactly the things that I liked to do. Now, the exhibition here uh, is sort of like an overview in works in times from 2004 up till 2013, even kind of recent. Um, and that is as well for the uh, particular uh, situation where uh, my partner Jacqueline Kuter and I uh, were invited to uh, collaboratively uh, exhibit uh, in this wonderful gallery. Well, actually, we were not even uh, 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 invited to collaboratively exhibit, exhibit, but we were just both invited. <laughs> and um, I mean, we could have said like, okay, I take this part of the gallery and then we build a wall and then you take that part of the gallery or something like that. So, um, but since uh, we've been together now for almost 20 years, and then suddenly we realized that in those 20 years we had actually never exhibited together. Like uh, her projects, I assist on her, and vice versa. She tells me what to do, and um, uh, but never like the work is next to each other uh, in one presentation. And in order to uh, to make this exhibition, we started to review our work and go over all the work that we did and compare themes that were actually uh, within that work uh, present uh, and that kind of like connected several works um, and then for the, basically what you could say if you would uh, limit that down to, uh, to uh, um, limit it down to, to an essence it's like uh, Jacqueline Couture you see many of the photo, many of her videos include people and she worked with people with figures and actually seeking an environment you could say and I photographed spaces that were empty spaces utility spaces but slowly bit by bit there are more uh, traces of uh, human presence uh, in within the photographs so there we saw sort of a motion within within our developments we could say like, okay, here you see that our perspectives towards what we are doing are crossing. There's crossing perspectives. And, and that we kind of like sort of gathered around uh, in a way that you can jump from one work to the other work. Uh, in my case, to stick with the photographs, I think it's nice to, say, to, to mention here uh, that this uh, opportunity for me is uh, therefore uh, wonderful uh, because it turned out that the works we selected were in my case many times photographs that were part of projects but then within the entire project dropped out because like for example the traces of, of, of human presence in the photographs or they were just not fitting the entire concept so there's so like these these very sorry and, and dear uh, photographs that are very dear to me but then I still had to uh, not show and uh, so there's uh, several photographs actually 
uh, that had never been exhibited before, and that in this uh, context got a, got a function within the whole of the <coughs> exhibition. By uh, um, moving from one photograph to the other, of course, we try to jump from one space to the other, which is not, uh, uh, that are in, in meaning maybe not connected, but can um, bring up different kinds of associations as well. Uh, as within a um, um, in a story that you read from one chapter to the other, but as well like you run or you walk or you explore a building where you've never been before, and that uh, hits on, like one of my main themes, maybe which is sort of like implicit present in the work, and what I try to uh, make explicit in the presentation as such, which is then um, um, the memory. Uh, in use of, of spatial perception, like you uh, explore space, you use your memory. It's of course in two ways. Um, if we, um, if you go, and you're in this uh, gallery for the first time, you've been through the entrance, and you remember like how you entered this building, and because because you make mental notes of everywhere you go, and those mental notes make it possible for you that you have an idea where you are. Otherwise, without those, you would be lost entirely wherever you are at any moment. The other thing, of course, is that uh, if you're in space, the space may uh, bring up associations, uh, memories from, from spaces where you have been before that were just like the space that you are in, and that gives you an idea to interpret the space where you are. It's a gallery, we can expect art, and if you see a space like this, you can say like, oh, there might be some chance that we hit on some art here. Um, and same thing with, with the workshop or classroom and so on. Um, in, the, uh, uh, in this exhibition, um, it is visualized, that's kind of like within the structure of the entire exhibition, that there are elements which are repeated in, on different locations of the exhibition. So you see something, and on another moment you might see the same thing or the same element again because they are they are linked together and i'm not going exactly to tell you where and that's not that it's not a quiz that you have to figure out where it is it's just that if you hit upon it then um, you might uh, you might notice it as such um, and actually it was only today that i realized uh, that when i was sort of like preparing this that that's the same as with uh, when you tell a story or or a movie script or a, a theater play that uh, if you bring in elements in the story, you know, they have to be used somewhere else in the story. So that way you draw the audience into the story. And that's kind of like what we do. So besides uh, spatial perception and all those things, it's as well the stories of the photographs as such. Well, that's, I think, sort of a nice, maybe brief introduction of the work. Uh, I don't know how long I've been talking right now, but. Um, um, well, if there's any questions, uh, I would like to uh, please bring them up. Um, yes? Uh, hey, uh, when did you really know you wanted to become an artist? Well, that's, uh, that's uh, actually when I was kind of like 13, maybe, as I was a toddler and uh, very unhappy with the entire world around me, and I went to high school, and that uh, was a uh, nightmare as well, except for the drawing class. <laughs> And that was apparently the only thing I was good at. Um, and so from there on I thought, well, then that's the way I have to go. And it always stayed that way. Cool. <laughs> <coughs> and you had a question too? Yeah. Were your themes similar when you were painting? Or have they evolved since? You um, yeah, that's a very long, uh, long timeline. I, uh, but no, uh, I developed themes actually while I was still painting. I was already working about uh, it. Was already about kind of like architectural relations uh, within the paintings uh, and, and and the drawing. So I was interested into that and as well. Uh, but then it was more related as well to the construction of the painting, like abstract paintings and the construction were then remnants of architecture and as well decomposition. Uh, and I used photography uh, already, but then more to document my subjects, uh, what I could use in, um, uh, in a painting. Actually, I always made deliberately as bad photographs as possible uh, for avoiding that I would be tempted to present a photograph as an end product. So I thought, so that, you know, I just take a picture and then I go in my studio and I 
start looking what it's about and what, how I can I can use it. And that kind of like slowly changed. Yes. Um, so when you started to get into photography, um, did you like ever do film or anything with film, or are you always like digital? Um, no, I never did. You mean film like uh, uh, negatives or film like yeah. moving pictures? Oh, uh, negatives. Yes, negatives. of course. I mean, when I started, there was no digital photography. <laughs> so uh, that's only from the past 10 years, basically. Oh. And um, uh, so actually, I made the entire transition, which is uh, rather interesting. Um, but uh, like when I was painting and drawing as well, I was working with black and white and I printed my own photographs and sometimes I did blow them up and, and make them sort of like big collage out of them. But then I saw like, well, you know, it's a nice photograph, but what do I do with it? So I teared it apart and then started painting over it again and uh, well, that went on like that. But when it really became serious as uh, photography uh, in itself, um, I, had, I had started I turned to color photography but I had no experience in reading negatives so much. In black and white I could, but not in color. And that uh, troubled me because I did not want to depend on um, uh, people in white coats on the other count, behind the counter that told me, well, this is the best we can get out of it, and then I, of the negative, and then I had to accept that. So I started to photograph with the slides and transparencies. Um, and then from a very early moment on, started to scan those in that was just like the early of the beginning of the 21st century. Oh, that was 97, 98, I think already that started. Um, and then I could at least work on the colors myself. So I felt that if I make the print or if I do something, I'm in control of what happens, even if it's wrong. It's me that did it wrong. Don't blame somebody else for it. So, and then after that, of course, uh, well, it, uh, all photography became more digital. And I think since 2008, I am entirely digital. Uh, the fact is that um, that is an analog photograph, and the uh, one on the back with the, the basement with the leather suit, that's an analog photograph as well. And, oh, and those two there as well, two smaller ones. And the others are digital. So it's kind of like gradually went, and now in this, uh, this exhibition, it's still kind of mixed. Techniques. Yes? Do you have an online website? Uh, I have a website. It's called onewallaway.com. One. One wall away. Wall away. Wall away. Like behind the wall. <laughs> or if you take down one wall, where will you get them? Yes? This might be a tough question to oh, yeah. answer, so bear with me. Okay. If you could pick one piece of advice but to give art students, yes. what would it be? One piece of advice? A powerful piece of advice. <laughs> <laughs> Go for it. Go for it. <laughs> um, no, there, there is... Uh, yeah, that, that is definitely a difficult question, but uh, there's so much uh, uh, which you could do. Um, um, but I think mainly, uh, as, as I just described, um, the moment, what, what is for me was very significant in, in, in how I developed my work was the moment that I realized I'm not going to ask the question whether it's art, I'm first doing it. And then we'll see, and then, then see later what the meaning of it is. But that is for me personal. There are other people that maybe are, have much more sense of strategy and that can work with, uh, with uh, preconceptions of art and then function in that. So, um, but I think in that sense, uh, trying to, uh, to listen, uh, it sounds maybe a little bit uh, 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 floating, but uh, listen to your inner voice and stuck to that. Mm. And that, that is very clear. And don't, don't look too much to what you think the world requires from you if, you, if it's for art or for your personal work that you will go. And that's, uh, I think that that is what I would always try to emphasize. Oh, that raises a lot of questions. Yes? Um, you mentioned stories before, and that's sort of particularly interesting because I'm studying animation and illustration, so yes. like, I'm really into that. And I was wondering how you developed your interest in stories and then created your art. Like, how did you tie that together and sort of make a career around? Career. Um, <laughs> well, I, I don't make a career around stories, but um, 
Um, I think that, um, well, back, back there is a book, and that's the left, the book on the left. So maybe uh, somebody could bring that over to me. The book on the left. So that, that maybe that, uh, this is where it's kind of like, thank you very much. Um, so this is a, a book, uh, One More Way, it's called after the website, or, um, and um, it's about hidden spaces in Chicago. Uh, the fun thing is that there's not a single photograph from this book in this exhibition. I worked on the photographs uh, from 2003 until 2007, and, um, uh, and I was uh, commissioned to make a book out of it. And so they all show landmark buildings in Chicago, uh, but then the hidden spaces, the spaces uh, like the Chicago Theater, I'll just hold it up, so like that. Uh, that's the Chicago Theater, you see on the right side, but then the attic above the auditorium that nobody sees. Then Chicago has famous bridges, and that's the space underneath the bridge where nobody ever comes, except technicians. Actually, the, the, this is, the, I don't know who's ever been in Chicago, well, of course, all of you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Not no? everybody in here. Okay, it's so close by. Um, uh, John Hancock building, that's that big, big black building that rises up. And this is then actually the top floor right underneath the roof. So when I ask, for example, people, or people tell people I went to the top floor of the John Hancock Tower, and they said, like, oh, was that the observation desk? I said, no, above that. So the idea of these photographs, and that's a bit the idea of the, and I come to your question, uh, is that um, uh, if you have this photograph, it kind of like implements to you with your, the knowledge that you have about this building. You know the building, if you've seen it at least, uh, and then if you look at the building, you could say like, well, you see these neon lights, the ring of neon lights, which runs all along uh, the roof actually, and, um, and that is this space. So then the space, so the photograph kind of like influences your perception of what the building is like. Now, notice that all these photographs that I show in here are on the right page. Because I wanted to make a, a book and I, what I didn't like, because all the photographs were kind of like independent of each other, uh, I didn't want to put two photographs uh, next to each other because they're sort of like uh, condemned to be together, where they are sort of like uh, uh, actually as well separate. So what I did then, because I worked with those transparencies, as I just described, I went to, I think, uh, the owner of this book deserves a new copy now. Um, like here you have the front, this is the first space. This is the Unity Temple in Oak Park, the space above the uh, uh, glass ceilings. And since it's transparency and we're talking the, about the other side of the wall, I thought, well, there's another side of the, the, the other side of the negative as well, or of the, uh, the transparency. And that is what you see here on the other on the on the back page. That was the idea of like if you have different uh, mental images that you take the image with you and then into the new space where you come and then bind them together. So well, the other photograph here, which is actually the concert hall in Chicago, but then the roof above the auditorium or this the ceiling. Um, and then we go to the following page, and it's maybe difficult at the back, maybe, but here you see. In fact, um, a combination of the two previous photographs. So the two previous photographs were together, glued together into a new image. And I found that actually so much fun to do. So uh, I started uh, making combinations of how the photograph looked on the back side, and thus actually defining the order into which uh, the, you saw the following pages. So this actually becomes a story a linear story from first page to last page and you can only see it in this order because otherwise in a different order these pages should change so that way it's sort of like how the storytelling in, in essence <coughs> came into um, uh, into the work as it was um, it was sort of like it made it a linear development from beginning to end but based in this, in this gallery and for this exhibition is more associated so there's all these different things uh, but there's often as well a story tied to them. So I hope that kind of like answers your question. <laughs> yes. Um, when you put your photos out for the final and viewing, 
how much editing do you do? What do you mean? The final viewing? Like, put them on the walls of galleries or? Uh, well, that, that differs, but you mean like um, editing in sense of spacing out or? In sense of like after you take the photo, yes. do you apply any after effects? Yeah, or like how many? No, hardly. Uh, what I do in, in, in composition or in, in, in the, in, in, on the computer is color management and actually the, the regular tools to, to work on the photograph, but I don't apply elements that were not there or, or take them away. Maybe seldom needs a, a detail, but uh, no, that is um, so. So it is what you see is what was there, so to speak. If that's what you were referring to. Uh, yeah, I just meant like you leave pretty much right out of the camera. Almost. I'm sorry. You pretty much leave your photos right out of the camera, almost like. Yeah, in in a way, it's. Uh, 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 yeah, I, I don't I don't add things to it. That's more I, can, I cannot say about it, I think. Yes. But, or unless yeah, you. Yeah, that, that's, that's fine. <laughs> yes? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Um, kind of along the same lines, so do you ever like combine multiple exposures? Yes. Like, okay. That I've so done. Do that then it's still, it's still there. And uh, since uh, with this uh, uh, digital work, actually, at some point a couple of years ago, uh, but this is maybe for people that are not within photography, so I do it really fast. Anyway, I work with the shift camera. So it shifts, so it means that if I make my composition, uh, actually I don't make my composition because I can't look through the camera, so I have to kind of like estimate it, but as well I can shift and make another, another exposure and I can shift the other way, so I actually have a huge field and then I can, afterwards I can define the profile which becomes the photograph. And the funny thing is that uh, that way often there's unexpected things that actually were eventually outside of the image of the photograph that get included and then all of a sudden I think, oh, that's actually very worthwhile to have that in the photograph. Often, you know, the thing that, that is really essential to what you're looking at takes place right outside your view. And that's my view. You're, you're focusing on something and then apparently it's something else that, that actually made it work. So. Yes? Um, I'm a graphic design major and yes. we're learning a lot about um, typographic grids and just how to comp uh, you know, organize your compositions and I noticed a lot of that throughout your photography and I was wondering, especially in the spaces that are clearly inhabited as opposed to just vacant spaces, how much of the original composition, like how the furniture is laid out, how much of that do you just leave alone? Like, do you organize the furniture in the way that it's shown in the photographs? Or you Definitely not in that case, because that was an, uh, an, an accessible space. So, no, I, I don't. Uh, uh, no, I don't change anything except, for example, the photograph on the on the far end there, because I put the photograph in there. So then, of course, I, I that is my my addition to the image, which defines the image. Um, but for all the other works, uh, I think no, everything was exactly the way it was. It is all about the composition, how you place yourself towards uh, the, uh, the subject that defines how the photograph uh, uh, appears to you. And I think maybe uh, the clearest is that is visible with the uh, photographs on the, on the far end, the, uh, the five-piece work. Um, because those are all uh, compositions I did on the spot, but I definitely tried in that in those photographs to um, uh, emphasize the the atmosphere of, of, of kind of like being enclosed and having no room to move that I felt when I was on that uh, in that building. As the photographs represent um, the Stasi prison, Eastern German Sicherheitspolizei, uh, or the Staatssicherheit, where they actually sort of like. Uh, detained all their suspects of anti-socialist sympathies. And um, well, and then in the, in the photographs itself, what shocked me was that the, the entire environment was sort of like, well, you see the plywood furniture and simple doors, uh, you know, cozy, uh, homey uh, uh, wallpapers and cheap vinyl uh, floor uh, patterns. And it's sort of like shocking that to, to see, it's sort of like you know the banality of evil that you think like 
it is all there, and, and yet it was such a place of terror. And it looks like uh, actually like a worn-out hotel. So I wanted to see the cheap show the cheapness of it, but as well that the compositions are, are so. For example, the second on the right, uh, so are so put so much together that there's no room that you can move. Like in that one, you see a little bit of floor on the bottom right corner, and then for the rest, and everything is in focus. So the doors that are further away really move forward. So there's no place space actually to, to, to leave the building, so you get captured uh, on the spot. So that is what I try with the, with the composition and, uh, and so on. But I don't change the interiors. Yes. Uh, is there a method to finding locations to shoot in? Because obviously you've traveled all over the world. Well, I nice that you, you have the impression. Um, um, I find that, that, that rather difficult. Um, I know. I think I, I, I am curious for, for places and then, then you go there, but often um, um, I hit on places by, on, on space by accident. And um, uh, yeah, so like we were there. It's usually like, I, I don't feel myself really very much of a traveler, because a traveler, to my opinion, sort of like always moves on. And I always feel like if I go somewhere, um, as if every time I, I, I arrive somewhere, I feel that there's another place where I have to return to, as, as you know, because most of the well, uh, the Forbidden City, which in, in, I mean, we visited and we were there for a week, and then I found that spot, and then I had to return there to make the photograph. So, uh, so I, therefore, I mean, maybe I go to many places, but uh, it's more what I what I find accidentally uh, for spaces that trigger my uh, I don't know what. Uh, fascination, so to speak. Well, how long are we here? Well, we have another 15, 20 minutes. I have a, I have a question. <laughs> and, and, uh, I don't know. Maybe it's not a fair question. But you've, you've been in the States, you've worked in the States, United States, and you live in the Netherlands. Yes. Um, you know, in Amsterdam, which I think a lot of people here probably have not been to, but it carries kind of, uh, I think if you look on the surface, some, some different meanings or people think of different things when they think about Amsterdam. But could you briefly describe maybe what the art scene is like uh, in the Netherlands or in Amsterdam itself? Especially as I know you have taught and are now teaching again at a study abroad program there. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, I always try to encourage students to, to consider studying somewhere else so that they have a range of exposures. So if you could just maybe um, mention what it's like. I know it's hard when you live someplace. <coughs> it's like, what's Fredonia like? <laughs> um, and, and Amsterdam has a vivid art scene, that, that's for sure. And um, uh, I think essential to Amsterdam as such is like that uh, Mick Jagger uh, defined Amsterdam as the smallest metropole in the world. Um, so he thought it's nice and cozy and yet there's sort of like some international um, feel to it. Um, but I think that uh, for the past years uh, Amsterdam has been, uh, uh, you could say, suffered for the fact that in the 90s, 90s I mean, say, uh, it started, uh, the, or the, the, the beginning of the 21st century, actually. Um, every self-respecting museum and theater uh, decided to uh, undergo some uh, thorough renovation and ambitious, uh, often, uh, new construction. And uh, through that, it, it turned out uh, completely unplanned that 90% uh, of all the museums and theaters were closed at some point. And it's not so much that uh, that all the uh, that there were less tourists because that, but it meant, meant as well uh, definitely uh, that there was less international information, as the museums and the, and the uh, theaters basically are very international oriented, which means you have a lot of input, and uh, if that drops back, then it becomes more provincial in its atmosphere. And I think that that is something we we have been suffering from, and I really hope that it'll come back again now. All these uh, museums and all these places are open to the public again. Um, then, for the other thing, is that um, um, the Netherlands, as such, uh, had a sort of like a sophisticated 
a system of funding the arts, uh, but through uh, following um, governments at this point, uh, people are trying to uh, remodel uh, the entire society to a more Anglo-Saxon uh, 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 economy, which means that there's absolutely no funding and then uh, it has to be privately uh, funded, all the arts or private uh, foundations. And the problem with that is that we come from a different mentality as there was always people to pay more tax, but there's more government money to fund uh, all the things that needed to be funded, which meant that if you had, if you turned to private people in order to support the arts, it was usually the, the response you got was like, well, I pay my tax, so turn to the government. Now that is so shows something that what is very what, what actually I think as well uh, was a bad deal to the arts as such because it meant that people got indifferent and they were not um, uh, they were not committed to that what they actually uh, was happening and um, I think that now there's this mentality going on as people feel now like oh if I don't do anything to support it actually things will not happen. So you will see, you, you see at this point more enthusiasm for uh, people individually to uh, um, to support art and to be, uh, as well to be involved in it. But how that will develop in the long term, I cannot say. Well, one of the things that I think people may not realize too is the density of the Netherlands. Um, That's true. So. Yes. I was hoping you'd actually mention that. Oh, I'm sorry. That's all right. <laughs> well, I said like all the museums. Yeah. Well, what do you what do you what do you mean? Because I know in Amsterdam there's a lot of museums, but yes. then there oh, but Amsterdam and all the nearby towns. I mean, no, that's true. There's uh, uh, it's like the, the the western area of the Netherlands, which is sort of like uh, maybe uh, as large as the um, which you could consider uh, well maybe like if you take New York for an example, that would be not just Amsterdam because New York is much bigger, but the total area, the urban area, covers pretty much the whole western side of the Netherlands. We all have in that area a lot of cities, and every city has actually, uh, or every larger city, has a Museum of Contemporary Art and a Museum of Historical Art, and every city has a few uh, leading theaters, which means that uh, it's sort of like uh, in, in a range of, of one hour drive, you have six museums of contemporary art, uh, so, but you have to be silent about that because once the government will think that way, they will definitely shut <laughs> down something. <laughs> so, uh, so you could actually bike there, couldn't you? Or? Uh, you could, but you should be a trained biker. <laughs> <laughs> I would take public transportation <laughs> in in that sense. And uh, yes, but it's uh, it's true. And then of course there's the, the national heritage. If you're interested in painting, it's like uh, well. There's a high density of, as well, um, 17th uh, century paintings in particular. And um, the fun, funny thing is that, of course, these painters sort of rendered from a certain city. So in those areas, they are still around. Like Frans Hals is from Haarlem. I mean, that's familiar to you. Um, is from Haarlem. So there's many of his work is still in that city. And same with Rembrandt. And for example, because Rembrandt was grown up in Leiden, Leiden is actually a small provincial town, but they have some significant pieces of Rembrandt and, and as well from earlier on. So that's sort of like the reason, but that's something like you have in Italy as well. Uh, what I like about Italy, I don't sh I shift to Italy. Oh, you um, what I like there is that if you go to a city, in a small city that can be, but that was earlier in the 1400s, they had their masters that lived in that city, and then there you can see the work. And what I like about that is the locality of it that you have to go to that city in order to see that specific work. And I think that that you could as well take back to, for example, the United States. If you say, well, what happens here in Fredonia? Well, that is what you guys do here. So you define what is here. Yes? Now that you've exhibited together with Ms. Cooter, do you think you would do it again? Uh, we'll see later. <laughs> But we're still married, so it's, uh, no, no, worries, no problem about that. So. Yes? How often do you carry the equipment? I'm sorry? How often do you carry the equipment? Um, I think uh, for the most, I, it's interesting that you, that you asked that. 
in general, it was still such that, that because it's kind of like uh, uh, valuable and heavy, that I only brought it with me when I was uh, on a job or really intended to make a photograph. Uh, but currently, uh, like with the, the um, um, I, I actually try to have it as much as possible with me, and I'm trying to um, uh, develop my work, way of working into a more immediate way that I, if I'm in a space, I could immediately anticipate to that space and make a photograph. Where in these photographs, all I come back deliberately to say like, okay, I've seen the space, I want to make a photograph, and then I arrange a situation where I can do it. And um, so, but basically what I, what I try to do is, in, in, because, um, well, many of the photographs may look kind of controlled, and that's what they are, because I've kind of like figured out what I want to do. And I'm, I'm trying to create situations where I have lesser control. So there's more uh, things that can happen accidentally or things that I actually don't know whether it's good or bad that I really have to, to, to pound on that and see um, where it will lead me. <coughs> um, one thing I noticed about this exhibition um, that I wanted to ask you about is one of the biggest things I noticed is that the images are just tacked up on the wall. Yes. And I wonder if that's uh, uh, something you do more often now than you used to, or if, you know, what happens to these photographs when you take them down? Like, do they some, you know, do they go in the trash? Do they get framed and or sold? Do they, you know, what, what, how, yes. what's the life of, of the work and, and the um, way? The photographs are actually uh, pinned up on the wall just like that. Uh, for for practical reasons as well, um, and that's in particular as well for these uh, uh, canvas pieces. I mean, I roll them up, put them in a tube, and send to the uh, UPS, I believe, or some other uh, as well. Uh, and and then um, uh, actually, you put on it. That's kind of uh, if we talk about don't call things art necessarily. Don't think about it. You have to in order to. To, to uh, be uh, safe for for uh, income um, for import taxes, we put up display material, no commercial value, and, uh, <laughs> and you keep the value, production value below a certain amount, and it gets in here for free. And um, and then here, uh, actually, the hardest work for me was building frames. I'm not very good at that, but luckily, it's that you can only see when you look at the back of the frames. Uh, and then I stretch them up there. And that's like how you can. Make, take big things around uh, and then still um, display them on uh, on a location, which for me increases my mobility. If these works had been framed, it would have been very costly uh, to to make this exhibition work. And uh, so this way you can show everything. Um, and and for me as well, it's like this way it doesn't matter so much because I feel like the um, ordering on the wall is like a proposal. It's like you can look at them, it's not definite. And if you frame them, they are sort of like, you know, independent words for, for, I don't know, eternity, so to speak. And now it is more like uh, the whole thing is set up and you can see that there's, it's just uh, put out of the tube and put on the wall. And you can look and now make associations and it would be very easy to change them. But the life of the work is, well, I hope they come back in one piece <laughs> and uh, if you sell them you can frame them and uh, uh, certainly if they find a destination they might get uh, they might get framed I would think that would be very empowering for young artists because it can be so expensive yes. to exhibit work and I think just get it framed for exhibition I think the essence think of the good. photograph or the artwork is very well visible if you just put it on the wall and um, uh, I think uh, many frames are framing is, uh, is is not always necessary. Many frames is not necessary. Can I interject? You also yes. have displayed your work in public spaces in terms like the Giotto in Amsterdam. Mm -hmm. Those are printed on different surfaces and then yes. displayed outside. Is that correct? Yes. So it's not just um, you don't just usually exhibit in traditional, I guess, formats. Yes. Frame pieces and things. Yeah. No, that's that that is true. Um, um, that, that's where you come to like what I said. Maybe the different ways that photography. So that's more towards people that use photography. Um, 
can be used. Well, the thing with the framing, as I, I still say, the problem with the framing that I have is uh, is that it's sort of like immediately points you point down the photograph as such as a fine art work, work of fine art, uh, where I think it is uh, there is many more ways that you can deal with the work uh, in order to make the interaction between the photograph and its environment uh, uh, possible. So uh, what Tim French refers to is actually. Um, uh, a project I did and there are two photographs that are on this tiny wall uh, where you see sort of like a, a wallpaper with, with vertical lines. Those are two parts from 25 photograph series uh, that I made for a uh, actually construction site fence. So that's the, like well you know I mean who wants to exhibit on a construction site fence if you want to. Uh, so it was uh, uh, for that purpose, and I took pictures of the um, uh, interiors of the buildings uh, surrounding the, this, the fence and connected them to each other by taking a photograph of one space, placing it in another space, and then photographing the photograph space with the environment. And then um, I took another photograph of that specific space and placed it as a photograph in another space. So it was sort of like an ongoing chain that you, in the photograph, goes from go from one place to the other. Actually, that was as well uh, uh, narratively uh, development from, from left to right. Um, and then they were printed immediately on die bonds. Uh, so that's just like commercial uh, where, where billboards were printed on and were kind of like framed, uh, without frames actually just put on the wall. So, and it worked actually very well. So, uh, so I think that that is something you can um, you have many, many options for how you can uh, apply photography. Uh, any other questions? All right, well, thank you very much. I'm sure if some of you have some. Uh, Questions you want to ask Jan to, you know, quietly by himself, he'd answer for the next 10 minutes.